if you could name the most useful tool in every sysadmin's DevOps and App Developers Toolkit, that would definitely be Socket. Okay, maybe Ping and Telnet are higher on the list, but Socket would definitely make the top three. If you are not familiar with what this tool can do for you, then please sit tight and watch. You won't be disappointed. We'll talk about exposing services, forwarding ports, adding SSL to a legacy application and building an encrypted tunnel. My name is Philip. Let's get started. Socket is a versatile networking tool that allows you for bi-directional data transfers between two endpoints, like processes, files, sockets, and more. It's often used for custom data transfer solutions, network testing, debugging. It supports multiple protocols, encryption, authentication, port forwarding, proxying, and much more. Today, we just touch the tip of the mountain. Socket expects a source as the first parameter with some optional switches for that source and the destination with some optional switches as the second parameter. As the source, we can specify dash to indicate standard input, TCP for listen to indicate we want to accept TCP connection over IPv4 protocol on a specific port, TCP 6 listen to indicate we want to accept connections on EPV6 protocol, uh, TCP listen to indicate we want to accept TCP connections on both EPV4 and EPV6, OpenSSL listen to indicate we want to listen for TLS connection on specific port, and of course many more like files, processes, UDP, named pipes, pseudo terminals, Unix domain sockets, and more. On the destination, you can specify dash as the standard output, TCP4 to indicate you want to connect to a TCP EPV4 endpoint, uh, TCP6 to indicate you want to connect to EPV6 endpoint, uh, TCP to indicate you want to connect to either EPV4 or EPV6 endpoint on a specific IP endport. Open SSL Connect to indicate you want to connect to TLS endpoint and many others. Let's begin with a very simple scenario just to familiarize ourselves with how Socket works. Let's imagine having two servers, node 1 and node 2. We'd like to listen on TCP port 8080 on node 2 and whatever we receive we'd like to display on the screen. On the other hand, we'd like everything that we type from the keyboard on node 1 to be sent to node 2 port 8080. We'll be needing two socket instances. As the source, in the first instance, we would put dash to indicate the source is standard input. As the source for the second instance, we put TCP listen 8080 to indicate that we'll be listening on TCP port 8080. Now as the destination on the first instance, we would put TCP node to 8080 to indicate that whatever we receive should be sent to node 2 on port 8080. As the destination on the second instance, we would put dash to indicate that whatever we receive should be displayed on the standard output. Those are our parameters for two socket instances. First instance will have dash as the source and TCP node 2 as the target. Second instance will have TCP listen as the source and dash as the target. To make it more clear, let me show it to you in practice. I'm going to node 2 and starting socket with TCP listen 8080 as the source to indicate I want to accept a new connection on TCP port 8080 and dash as the destination to indicate I want to display everything I receive to the console. Now I'm going to node 1, starting socket, with dash as the source to indicate I want to read from the keyboard and TCP node to 8080 as the target to indicate I want to send everything to the remote location, that is node 2 port 8080, just like a telnet or netcat. Let's send a message from node 1. 
As you can see, Node2 got it. Let's send a reply back. Yup, it works. What if we'd like to establish connection to Node2 from yet another server, in our case, Node3? Let me try that by executing the same command from Node3. We got an error. Node2 is not listening for new connections. Let me draw a diagram to show where we are at. We have three servers, Node1, Node2, and Node3. We'd like Node2 to listen on port 8080 and whatever it receives to be displayed on the screen. We'd like Node2 to accept connections from both Node1 and Node3 that will send us data from their standard inputs. We'll be running SOCAL processes on all three nodes. Let's figure out parameters that each socket should be running with. Socket 1 source is dash to indicate standard input. Socket 2 source is TCP listen 8080 to indicate we'll be listening on port 8080 for incoming connections. Socket 3 input is also dash as we want to get data from the keyboard. Regarding destination, socket 1 will have TCP node 2 8080 to indicate we want to connect to node 2, port 8080, and push traffic there. Node 2 will have dash as the output, as we want to display the traffic on the screen. Node 3 will have identical setup as node 1. Now going back to the error. By default, Socket is handling only one connection. If you want to spawn more processes for every connection it accepts, you need to add fork option. On top of that, I'm adding a reuse address option because if there is any connection in time wait state, I won't be able to start socket. Okay, looks like there are no more connections in time wait state, so we can start our socket. Now let's go to node 1 and try reconnecting from node 3. Voila! Node 1 and node 3 did connect to node 2. Thanks to fork option, there are two separate processes on node 2 handling connections, and third process listening for new connections. Let me send a message from node 3. Now, let me send message from node 1. Now, a reply from node 2. Now that we know very basics of socket operation, let's move to some practice examples. Let's start with our first use case, that is exposing services. Let's imagine we have a Node2 server with HTTP service running on localhost port 8080. We can run a socket application on Node2 that will listen on the public interface on port 8080 and pass the traffic to localhost. The command to do that will be socket tcp listen 8080 to indicate we want to accept connections on port 8080 followed by tcp localhost 8080 to indicate that we want to forward the traffic to localhost 8080, where our HTTP service is running. Let me show you that in practice. I'm starting an HTTP service on node 2, listening on loopback interface port 8080. Let's try connecting from node 3 to that HTTP service. As expected, the connection fails. Let me run socket application on node 2. We'll be listening on port 8080, protocol EPv4, hence TCP4 listen 8080. The fork option will allow us to handle multiple requests. Reuse address option will allow us to quickly restart socket if needed. Bind node 2 will cause socket to listen only on the public interface. Okay, we have the listening side ready. On the forwarding side, we did specify TCP4 localhost 8080 to indicate we'd like to pass the connection to our service listening on port 8080 on the loopback interface. Let me try connecting from node 3 one more time. As you can see, port forwarding works. We can add dash V option to the socket to see actual traffic that passes through the application. Let me run the CORL command one more time. Now, let's switch to socket output. As you can see, we got 428 bytes reply logged from the HTTP server. Most common socket use case is port forwarding. It's very useful in many situations when you need to allow incoming traffic from the internet or another network to reach a specific service on your local network. Let's imagine we have 
HTTP service listening on port 8080 on the Node 3 server in our internal network. We can configure Socket application to listen on port 8080 on Node 2. That is our DMZ. So that if someone connects from the outside, in this example Node 1, the traffic will be forwarded to our internal service on Node 3. The command to do that will be socket tcp listen 8080 to indicate we want to listen for incoming connections and then tcp node 3 8080 to indicate that whatever we receive should be forwarded to node 3 on port 8080 on the internal network. Let me demonstrate that in practice. I'm starting our HTTP server on port 8080 on node 3. Next, I'm starting socket service TCP listen 8080 to indicate we'll be listening for incoming connections on TCP port 8080. Fork option to instruct socket to spawn more processes for every connection. Then reuse address option so we can quickly restart socket if needed. Followed by TCP4 node 3 8080 to indicate that the traffic should be forwarded to our internal HTTP service that's on node 3. Let me test if the forwarding works by executing CURL command from node 1. As you can see, we did connect to node 2 that passed the traffic to the actual HTTP server on node 3. Very useful option is dash D. You can put between one and four dash Ds. This will show you a debug log of what's actually going on. Let me run the CURL command again and let's see what has been logged. Socket is accepting connections from 10 to 30. That is node 1. Spawning a child process to handle that connection and in turn connect to 10.232, that is node 3, to handle the request. As you can see, due to the fork option, the original process is still waiting for new requests. Another useful option is dash t. It will set up an inactivity timeout so that if a process is inactive for a specific amount of seconds, the connection will be terminated. I recommend setting this option because if the backend server is not terminating an idle connection, you may run out of resources. Just for a demo, let's set the connection idle timeout to five seconds. Now let me connect from node one and sit idle for five seconds. Voila, I got disconnected. On the other hand, if you need your application to keep the connection up at all times, so that any firewall in between will not close the connection due to no activity, you can add the following options to socket. Keep alive to enable sending keep alive on the socket. Keep idle to set time in seconds before sending the first keep alive. Keep interval to set interval in seconds between two keep alive. We'll add it to both listening and sending sockets. This will prevent our connection from going down. Last thing I want to show you in port forwarding is to listen on EPV6 and forward to EPV4. Yes, it's possible. Let's do socket TCP6 listen to indicate we'll be listening on EPV6 port 8080. Fork, reuse address. Now EPV only option to indicate we want to listen only on EPV6. Now the forwarding part. TCP4 to indicate we'll be connecting to a EPV4 endpoint, node 3 that is the target and port 8080. Let me jump back to node 1. Let's check the EPV6 address of node 2. It has only a link local address, but for our demo purposes that's fine. Let me do a CURL and provide the EPV6 address and port of node 2. It works. Let's enable debug log on node 2 by adding dash dd. Let's try the connection. In the logs, you can see EPV6 connection got accepted and traffic was forwarded to EPV4 connection on the backend. Now something that will blow your mind away. The socket support for TLS. If you have a legacy application that does not support TLS and you'd like to expose a TLS endpoint, or if you'd like to connect from your legacy application to a TLS endpoint, then socket can do it on your behalf. Let's say we have HTTP service listening on port 8080 on node 3. It can handle only unencrypted plain traffic. Let's run socket application on node 2 listening on port 8 
443 with TLS and accepting TLS connections from node 1, then forwarding the traffic to node 3 on the backend without TLS. Basically, node 2 is doing TLS offloading. Here are the parameters that we'll use on Soka to make it happen. At the source, we'll use open SSL listen port 8443. As a destination, we'll put TCP node 3 8080 to indicate we want to send the traffic to node 3 on port 8080 without any encryption. Let's set it up in practice. First, I'm starting an HTTP service on node 3. Now we need to generate certificates for both server, that is node 2, and the client, that is node 3. To establish a chain of trust, we'll start by generating CA certification authority that we'll use to sign our certificates with. First, let's generate a self-signed certificate that will be used for our certificate authority. We'll do that with OpenSSL rec for new signing request, followed by X509 to indicate it will be a self-signed certificate, days 365 to indicate that the certificate will be valid for one year, new key ED25519, as we would like to create certificate request and private key of ED25519, key out to specify the file name for the private key, node S, not to encrypt the private key, out to specify the file name for the certificate. I'm accepting all the defaults here. As a result, we have root CA SRT, that is our CA certificate, and root CA key, that is our CA key. Now let's create a CSR, that is a certificate signing request for our server, that is node 2. I'm doing it with OpenSSL rec to indicate we like a certificate signing request to be created, new key ED25519 to create both ED25 key along with the signing request, node S, not to encrypt the private key, key out to specify the file name to store the key, and out to specify the file name for the CSR. Important thing is to put the DNS of our server in common name section. If you use IPs, please provide IP here. Okay, our CSR has been created. Nowadays, most services require certificates with sun subject alternative name present. It's not possible to pass that to OpenSSL from the command line, so let's first create a server X file by putting sun DNS as node 2. Let's also create the same file for client by putting sun DNS as node 1. If you are using IPs, please put IP.1 equals and then your IP. We'll use those files during the signing process. Finally, let's generate our server certificate based on the signing request. Let's do that by doing OpenSSL X509 as will be signing certificate request, recu to indicate we are providing a certificate signing request as the input, CA to specify our CA certificate, CA key to specify the key that the certificate will be signed with, in option to specify the source file with the certificate signing request, out to specify the result file for the signed certificate, days 365 to indicate how long the certificate will be valid for, CA, create serial to create a new serial number, ext file to read parameters about sun from server ext file. Okay, a certificate has been created. In order to pass it to Socat, we'll need a certificate to be in PEM format. Concatenating server private key with server certificate will do the trick. Here's how our PEM server certificate looks like. I'm repeating the same steps for client certificate. I'm generating CSR. Please keep in mind node 1 as the common name. I'm generating certificate based on CSR and signing it with a CA key. Now I'm generating a PEM certificate by concatenating client key and client certificate. Let's copy the client certificate in PEM format that has both private key and the certificate to node 1. That will be our client. Let's also copy a root CA certificate, just the public part, without the key, 
to Node 1 as well. PEM certificates will be used to authenticate server to the client and vice versa. Root CA certificate will be used to check that the certificates are valid. Finally, after these long preparations, we have everything we need to start our socket. I'm starting the process with dash DD option to see debug log. Then open SSL listen 8443 to indicate we want to listen for TLS connection on port 8443. Reuse address and fork to handle multiple connections. Then I specify server certificate with cert and CA certificate with CA file. Once the connection is established, I want the traffic to be forwarded to node 3 on port 8080 without any encryption. Let's go to node 1 and try to make a request with CURL. I'm doing CURL HTTPS to indicate we'll be doing TLS connection. Then node 2 port 8443. Now CA cert to specify a file with our CA certificate and cert to specify our certificate that we'll use to authenticate. It works. In debug logs, we can see that TLS connection was accepted and that data has been forwarded to node 3 without TLS. We can also validate that by adding dash V option to the CURL command. It will give us more verbose output. As you can see in the logs, the connection is protected with TLS. It's also possible to use Socket on the client if your application does not support TLS. Let's quickly spin up Socket instance with TCP Listen 8080 to indicate we'll be listening for unencrypted connections, followed by OpenSSL Connect Node 2 8443 to indicate we'll be forwarding traffic to TLS endpoint listening on node port 8443. Let's provide our certificate and CA certificate. Let's put the process in background. Lastly, I'm running the CURL command to a non-TLS localhost endpoint. As you can see, the connection got forwarded to remote system. You can specify the verify equals zero option to skip certificate validation altogether. Please also mind that if you'd like to listen on port below 1024, you need to have elevated privileges. Because we have all the certificate setup to perform mutual authentication in place, let's do one more cool thing. We'll set up an encrypted tunnel between node 1 and node 2. On node 2, we'll start with sudo as we'll be adding a new interface, so it requires elevated privileges. Then open SSL listen 8443 as we'll be listening for new connections. Reuse address and fork to handle multiple connections. Cert to specify server certificate and CA file to specify CA certificate. Now on the other side, let's do TAN to indicate we want a new tunneling interface to be created. Let's specify the interface IP and app to indicate we want the interface to be up. Let's repeat the same step on node 1. We want the tunneling interface to be created. We'll specify the IP. We want the interface to be up. We want Socket to connect with SSL to node 2 port 8443, cert to specify client certificate file, and CA file to specify CA certificate. As you can see, a new interface has been created on node 2. Let's check node 1. Here we also can see the interface up. Let's ping the other end of the tunnel. It works. Let's run iperf as a server on node 2 and run speed test from node 1. All works. We could use this tunnel to route traffic. Amazing. 